Ladies and gentlemen, Gianfranco Rosi. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Please. I want to begin, dear Gianfranco, with a special uh, note of condoling you on the passing of a dear friend, a wonderful filmmaker whose film we celebrated last year in Idfa. It was Faith. Valentina was a close friend exactly of Exactly, these days. Yeah. So One before we begin, I want to first, on behalf of also Idfa's team, pay our condolences to you and to her family and friends. Valentina passed this morning. Uh, she was a she dear was, friend, a great filmmaker, and we'll miss her. And she was 42. It, she will be missed by all of us. So in the beginning, Valentina. thank you for being with us despite this painful day. Thank you. <clears throat> Gianfranco, why do you do this? I was here in this theater <laughs> with Boatman. Yeah? <laughs> years, years, years ago. And now it's going back to that emotion, and maybe I can answer why I'm doing this, because I remember how precious it was to be able to screen your film and your work, last years, years, years of pain, of struggling, of uh, stubbornness, and, and being in this theater, in a theater like that, and that's where film was meant to be, and that's where film has to survive in theater, and the idea of working so many years to have one screen there is such a precious thing. And thank you for being here, and thank you for being able to organize this in such a way that you still give life and breath to what the language of cinema is. Thank you, everyone, for doing that. It's our pleasure and honor to do that, and it's also an opportunity to welcome 250 house, households watching with us now. Which we all embrace, wherever they are. Uh, in addition to all of you here with us in the cinema. Uh, but what, what I, I, I can't resist but ask you, when you mention the importance of the language of cinema, what is it to you? How would you define this thing that you would miss if not here? I mean, for, for me, cinema is maybe a, a pretext in order to meet, to encounter. Without encounter, my movie doesn't exist because my film, they never born in a table, they never born with a pen. They born with a very small idea and very small or big need. And uh, that need then becomes uh, a necessity and becomes uh, a journey, a huge journey to discover what at the end will be taken. At the beginning, when I started filming, I was filming 16 millimeters, so everything was so precious and so uh, heavy. You know, to capture that 10 minutes in a, in a reel was huge work, it was very expensive, it was like you needed a lot of, uh, of knowledge somehow to use a camera, 16 millimeter camera, go out and start filming. So for me, it's always uh, the idea of an encounter. From that encounter, de developing a story, which I never know. When I start any project, I never know where it goes. When I start Boatman, when I start Below Sea Level, when I start Sicario, when I start uh, Sacro Gra, when I start Farazzi, when I start Notturno, it was a very small, tiny idea which was essential and was a, a synthesis of something, something that uh, maybe you wrote, uh, you're also my producer, one of my producers. And uh, I, it started with very few pages. And then those few pages became the film. At the end of a long, long journey, which lasted three years, in case of Notturno. In case of Boatman, lasted five years. And uh, Sicario was only three days of shooting. But I never know, when I put the camera down, what's going to happen in front of me. And this is what uh, I think I love about documentary. I'm one of the few documentaries that doesn't betray the idea of making still documentary because documentary has an incredible 
beauty, which is uh, experimental. You know, you can't keep experimental by making documentary. It has an enormous range of experimentation. And for me, every film is a matter of finding the right language in order to be able to tell that story, the story that I will encounter, which I don't know. And when you put the camera down, things happen in front of you. Things start to have their own, uh, their own shape and their own narration. And slowly, slowly, you start discovering the, the trace and the narrative about your film, which, as I say at the beginning, I'm completely uh, a foreigner to that. You know, I don't possess the film at the beginning. I have an idea which is there, which is very precise, and then I have to work around that. And that takes time. In fact, time, I say, always is my big ally in my work. Time, trust, and encounter with the place, with the people, with the situation. And from there, I start developing stories. Like a scientist that watch inside a microscope and things you don't see in the open uh, when you're looking around, once you put your eyes there in that uh, viewfinder, you start discovering a ratio, you start discovering a world which doesn't belong to to the view, to the open view. And uh, so the work is that somehow, you know, it's like the work of being able to put the eyes inside the viewfinder and start discovering a, a story, start discovering characters, start discovering something that will develop and at the end will become a movie. I only know that becomes a movie when I start editing the film. I sometimes I can spend years without watching material. When I did uh, Boatman, I spent probably five years without watching the footage. The footage was there sleeping, and then suddenly you decide to develop and watching, and you decide that maybe there's a movie there, but uh, you don't know till the end, you know, till the process, and you never know when this process is, is beginning, when it, this process is uh, ending. You know, when we announced that you would be uh, our guest of honor and that we will be showing a retrospective of your films, uh, various journalists and colleagues would ask me, so what films are you showing? And I would say, all of them. And say, w what film? I would say, everything he made. Because Gianfranco Rosi uh, doesn't come directly to the mind that your presence, the achievement of your filmography, of your career, is actually made up of six films. That this is it. And uh, every uh, film takes a very long time, and you need this time that you are, as you're mentioning. Sometimes I hate that my life is basically... So what did I do all these years? Six films, that's it. And all my life is impregnated by this six films, you know, because it takes so much time to do it. That basically my life, uh, I spend, okay, I have like a few parentheses, and I have a beautiful daughter, which I love dearly. But still, my life is dictated by this... Uh, that by this uh, stepping, by this film, six film. And, uh, you know, now I'm not a young kid, I although I still have the same energy. When I did Boatman, I was a young kid uh, coming out from NYU, discovering the camera, discovering the world, discovering the way of making film. I didn't know how to make a film. I didn't know how to put the camera. I didn't know anything. And I learned storytelling day by day, day by day, when I made Boatman. That was my... Although I made already NYU, which was my film school, uh, I really learned to make film, to, to approach a story uh, when I did Boatman. And then after Boatman passed 10 years to do the next film, because I thought I had, everything I had to say was there in that film, and I didn't have the need to make another film. And then 10 years passed by, and then came uh, Below Sea Level, which was another pain, you know, <laughs> because all these films were self-produced. I never had any producers or any any support, you know, on that. So it was a big struggle. And uh, I, I want to talk about that in a bit, about the journey of being, the journey from being self-produced with very low budget and hard uh, circumstances until you now are one of the most accomplished filmmakers in documentary film. And of course, the situation or the conditions of work are different. Uh, but first, I cannot. Uh, 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 but go back to the first film and maybe ask if we have the clip from Boatman uh, that we prepared, because I think we have to start in the beginning. It was exactly in the theater where it started. In this theater? Yeah. 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 We're Adifa. back. Can we play the clip, please? Mm -hmm. Oh. 
why, 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 why? This is Hindu system. Every time a European ask why, 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 why? Why very young marriage? Why young dead body thrown the river? Big dead body fire? Why every time people coming this river take bath? One time one European asked me, go, mm, why do Indian people use toilet paper? Look, how crazy. I'm to my thinking, you know. Yeah, this system coming, Hindu system, long way. It's no new system. Why, why, why every time ask? Indian all and the nice chicken, Siva lingam and postcard. I have so many things for your wife. So many things. I will look that. Looking. Dale, 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 dale. Nice chicken, sir. Indian art. And this is the coins. Victoria, Edward, Jar, Just India, Company, Alam Baba, Akbar period, Mughal period, Kusan period, Guptakal period. And this is the bronze pot carry Ganga water. Are you going to take a look at it? I'm going to take a look at it. I'm going to take a look at it. I'm going to take a look at it. So we wait here 10 minutes and I go to market buy some food and beetle. You like something? So why not you come with me? Together go. I wrote two things here I'm watching the film because I haven't seen the film. I say why and I say narrative uh, tool, dispositivo, the dispositive. This was the most hard things in this film. There's a long uh, background. If you have time, I can go back how the film started somehow. I was an NYU student and uh, I did uh, a short film in uh, Miami about people bathing. And you know, Miami was a place uh, 30, when I was at NYU, so 40 years ago, it was like nine, 22, 23. And uh, people bathed. there was a ritual on this. Uh, people were going to Miami to die somehow. It was like this uh, old, uh, retired people. Miami was not at the time the Miami, this is nice fashions and place and things. It was a very uh, gloomy place, you know, where people retired there and basically waited to die. And there was this incredible ritual in the morning, very early morning, these um, the retired people, they go and have touch with the water. And it was somehow a very sacred moment. And I started filming that. I made a very short film about this um, ablution. I mean, the water, well, that was the ocean, it was not a river. But there was still this sense of the water, of like uh, 
um, rebirth, you know, waiting for the death somehow. And I did a short film. And then someone told me that the reminder about the uh, friend of mine that was in India. He said, this is exactly what happened in Benares. And with this idea, I went to Benares without knowing anything and I encountered this incredible place. I went with my 60 millimeter camera, like three, four reels of things. And uh, I arrived in this place, uh, which is a city of death. It's the only place in the world where alive people and dead people, they frequent the same ground. It's uh, where people go to die. It's uh, for us in the Western, death is a huge taboo. It's something we cannot embrace, we cannot understand. Most of the time, we, they hide for us death. You know, I remember I never saw a dead people till that moment. You know, it was always hiding in the family when someone was dying, they never show it to you. You know, it's like the death is such a mysterious thing. And that death was everywhere. When I arrived in Benares for the first time, there was a huge uh, conflict between Muslim and Hindu. And I arrived at the airport and there were no taxi. There was nothing. I had to wait at the airport to have a lift to go to the place where I had my little hotel. And I had my camera, my little luggage. And I waited for hours at this um, checkpoint. And then uh, I said, well, I'll wait for someone who's going to go to the city and he's going to give you a lift there. And, the, and there was this tractor that arrived with a truck in the back and many people there. And they say, come up. And I came back, there was a dead body. They were going to the funeral. So my first trip was like going from the airport to the city with a dead body in front of me, just like truck. And I arrived there, I went, I checked out in the hotel. So I immediately encountered death there for the first time, you know. And uh, it was incredibly a fascinating idea for a young uh, to discover death, you know, what is death? My father was dying in that period and uh, for a brain tumor. So for the first time I confronted myself with the idea of death and what a better place than Benares to do this, you know. And I became this uh, walking around. Uh, I remember seeing the film of um, Robert Gardner, Forest of Bliss, which I didn't embrace that film so much. And it was a film, it was a time of ethnographic film. And I didn't know what I was going to film. I didn't know what, and for one month, two months, I was going with my Eclair camera with the six minute reel inside on the shoulder, just going around the city. And I didn't film one single frame in two months. Every day I was walking around the city. And then one day I decided to put the camera away, leaving the camera into the hotel, and said, today I'm gonna to be a tourist. I'm gonna to be in the Ganja, having a boat, and just be like all tourists do, just go on a journey on the Ganja. And I encounter Gopal. And I spent with him, first we bargained for one hour trip, then became two hours, then became three hours, then became the whole day with him. And he was just telling me, he was my, my voice, you know, like he was a tourist, he was a boatman, he was cheating on the prize. He was fantastic, the way, his sense of humor. And I went back to the hotel and said, hey, this is how my film has to be, one day on the Ganja as a tourist. Next day I went with my camera, with all my half an hour film that I had with me, and I shoot everything that day, from morning till night, with Gopal. I met him again, and of course it was a total disaster. Only two scenes existed, which is the beginning and the end of the scene, when I pay him and when I go on the boat. The rest was like to build. And since there became this trip, every twice a year, I never had money, I went back to India, so it was emotion, the film was an emotional reconstruction of that day, of that feeling that I had that day. It was endless, you know, for five years I was going back to reconstruct the emotion of that day with him in the boat. And that's what the film is, you know, every day I was meeting him, we were taking this journey onto the, into the river. I was a tourist. He was seeing, and I was also developing the language of cinema for me, because I didn't know how to make a film. I didn't know what it meant to put a frame, to put a camera, and that's when I learned. So the first things that I shot was a total disaster. And when, when I developed, I was like, ah, oh, there's nothing here. There's only two little scenes, beginning and end. Now I have to build whatever is there. And to build that, it took me five, six years, maybe seven. I don't even know. There's a myth about how long it took me to do that film, you know? But it was endless. And I just remember I finished that film when I was 28. 
And, uh, and the film was like basically going back, going back, going back, going back, spend time with him. He was my, my caronte, you know, taking me around, pointing me things, encountering things. And more and more that the relationship became closer and closer and closer with him. And he became my mentor in this journey. And, um, but you know, there was no phone, there was nothing. So I was leaving from New York, going to Benares, and I hoped to meet him. Because there was no phone, there was nothing. I could just, I hope I meet him. I hope I can meet Gopal. And he was always there. And we spent like months there. And maybe in one month, two months, I could have two, three scenes there. And I remember the idea from the beginning was like, okay, 60 millimeters perfect. I have to create the illusion of people being inside this boat and watching what I'm watching. So became this journey. And the idea was that of the film, to have the people entering with me in this boat and following this, uh, this journey without meta, I say, without an ending, without a place to go. So it's like wander around. It, 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 it's like a road movie, a boat movie, <laughs> with no destination. And there was never a destination on this film. And it took years, 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 years to build this um, 50 minutes. I shot maybe 12 hours of film, and every minute of the film was so precious and so things. So every minute is extremely thought, it's extremely, but not because I was, there was no acting there, I was just waiting for the right moment. That's what I learned with this film. Waiting for the right moment, putting the frame and waiting for the right moment in order to have a narration within that frame, to have a narration within that choice of frame. And had to be inside the boat, so it was very, very. Uh, the idea of cinema for me was there. You know, it was not just watching things around and covering things right and left. It was like boom, put a frame and wait that frame. And then we learned uh, with Gopal, he was my tracking shot. He was moving with the boat, and I was just giving him with like this with the hand, and he was falling very slowly. So it became this incredible work together, and I spent years in this boat with him. And um, the best moment was, of course, when I was not filming, because so many things were happening. And then I learned uh, in this movie that things was about missing things most of the time. We were talking today about that. You know, it was not about gain. It was about the most important thing was the time I was spending there. Sometimes I was, didn't feel like filming. I was just there, like, talking with him, like you talk to your best friend. And every time you took out the camera, it was a heavy duty, because that real, cost so much money, so you don't know if what you're, when you s start filming, you're gonna, it's worth it, you know, what you're doing there. So I became patient, became trust, became uh, giving the heavy and the weight to the frame and to the storytelling within every frame, you know? So there was an extreme awareness of the language of cinema and the language of um, documentary there, concert, because I wanted to use the language of cinema with the, with the weight of what you're feeling is real, is true. And, uh, and that's where I learned from somehow all my approach, and I don't think it changed much from that moment till my last film, you know, it's all there. It's, uh, it's about that five years of learning on your own, how to develop a story, how to create a synthesis, how to create a passage from one story to another story, how to go from one character to another character, how to film something that is uh, a moment, but that moment has a before and after, and you have to be able to create a synthesis constantly, constantly a synthesis, because every character has no time to develop, but there's something so profound, intimate, that becomes life. Everything's about this little spot, and this spot uh, is start and end. Also, when it's extremely, when you, when you read uh, the script of what they say, it's, it's, it's fantastic. It's like little poems, you know? Every time what Gopal say, what uh, the Carter says, what, it's like a synthesis of something extremely big that becomes there, becomes a moment, becomes a spot, becomes uh, essential, becomes life, essentially. I, I think that it is... Uh, uh, that's why it's essential. It was essential to me to begin with Botman because I can clearly see, and now you tell me that it's even more that this film defined your method in a way, that it is something that goes on. If I want to be a little more uh, uh, concrete, I would say 
the way you dealt at that age, at that moment of your career with the 16 millimeter expensive film, I don't see that you are working differently now, although it now practically costs nothing extra to film hours instead of filming a little. You are still filming very little and very measured. Um, the other thing is this construction or architecture you build from many small stories, or as you call them, poems. Uh, none of them is a full, complete class. They're not story. poems, they have the essence of a poem, yeah. And then the third point would also be the, um, the exploration. So your own angle is always, it's never the same, I can't say that. But there is something here that starts to me with his question or his anger at you. And, and that's why I say why here. Yeah. Why, 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 and every there, time a European that's, comes, and that's it's where why, learned, why, why. This is when I learned not to ask questions. And then uh, my friend Charles Bowden also once he say, Trafranco, you ask one question, you have one answer. You have a hundred questions. You have a hundred answers, it's not interesting. You have to be able to grab something which is so intimate and so universal and so big that no question, no answer can, can be enough, you know? So that's what your duty is, you know, to go deeper and deeper on that. And when, in this, why, 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 why you ask? Because I was asking questions there. and that moment, I stopped. That was the beginning. That was maybe the first week I spent with him. Why this, why that, why, 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 why? And then, you know, it was interesting because at the beginning, I was asking questions to him, and he was answering me questions. And then I thought, this is not interesting. And slowly, slowly in the film, my voice disappeared. And that's the moment where the audience, I think, is able to trust enough the relationship and then disappear completely from the film. And, uh, and the audience takes the place of the boat, you know, and has at least the, intim the illusion of this intimacy to be, to have the camera there. And that's, I never left, you know, in my work, you know. This is, this is clear because during Boatman, we hear your voice, you are there, and you And then are, disappear completely. You are asking questions, yeah. and then he says, stop, why, why, why? Yeah. You stopped why, why, why until Notturno. Yeah. So in all of your following films, until There's Notturno, no you There's stopped no asking why. Yeah. You accepted that you this are This is not... the moment I don't ask any more questions to anyone. Yeah. And in the film, this is the moment where my voice disappear, and the film becomes uh, the audience, unfortunately, they are part of the, of the narration themselves, or, or the journey. Mm. I have, is very important for me. That. I have uh, uh, prepared a clip from Sacro Gra. This is uh, your Venice uh, Golden Lion winning film um, that we, of course, are also showing as part of your retrospective at ITFA. As an example of one of those stories, those short stories that do not carry themselves as a film on their own, but are, are the, the element that you use to build the film. The chorality. Yes, and this element that I picked, it is from Sacro Gra, and this is the wonderful man who is so concerned about the environmental effect of the massive highway or around Rome mm -hmm. on nature. Yeah. Can we roll the clip, please? Eh, questa è perfetta. Il grido delle larve.
Eccolo. Questo può essere utilissimo a diffondere l'allarme. Devo però isolarlo, isolarlo pulito. Anche in linea teorica un, una sonda che eh, mi trasmette le vibrazioni perché eh, loro sentono sicuramente oltre al... insomma non hanno le orecchie come noi. Loro sono immersi in una massa, no? e quindi sentono molto di più eh, per contatto, sono dei suoni che si trasmettono all'interno di un corpo solido, non hanno la, la, stessa, la, stessa, non hanno la, la stessa situazione umana. Esatto, se io riesco a trasmettere alla massa questo grido di allarme, per me è importante perché poi posso farci altre cose da una parte dall'altra parte ci sono dei suoni, dei suoni di richiamo e quindi se io opero di fatto voglio opera, operare il push pull ovvero sia da una parte li voglio richiamare e dall'altra parte li voglio terrorizzare Questo è bello, questo è l'antipasto della vendetta, miei cari. Eh? In every film you made, with the exception of Il Sicario, in every film you made, you choose a space, you have an angle that you begin from, you go, jump into that place, and you start the hunt for these elements. And you never get what you expected, you always end up with something different. Because I don't expect anything. And when I start, I'm completely no expectation. It starts a journey, I don't know where I go. So that's what the beauty of art. I could never write a script, you know. If, I, if people ask me, why don't you write a script and make a feature film? Because uh, once I have a script, I will be so born to have this script make it into the movie. What I love is like to discover the story while I'm, while I'm doing it. I love this uncertainty, I love this... Uh, sense of wonder, this sense of discovery every day, every day, every day. It has an element that gives me a structure for the storytelling and I discover day by day. I don't know what's going to and I discover it tomorrow. I don't know what I discover will, will fit into this. Hmm. How, how do you define this element, uh, Gianfranco? It's, you go around Roma's uh, ring road, the the sacro, uh, the gra. It's you know? the biggest ring uh, in the in the world. It's uh, like a, it's like a highway, basically. It's the, it's the biggest highway in the world uh, so uh, around the city. It's like in, there's in London. Every city has its own. Uh, Amsterdam too. Of yeah, course. Amsterdam too. But uh, in Rome, you know, I, I'm not Roman. I arrived to Rome uh, after I married uh, with Anna. And after Emma was born, I decided to leave New York. New York was too expensive for a filmmaker to maintain a family. And I rented my, pl my place in New York and I went to Rome. And I started living there. And so Rome for me was always an element of... Uh, um, I, it's a city that I never really get 
involved, you know, I was like very detached from uh, from the city. For me, it was a point of arrival, a point of departure for other movie of the story. I had always to leave Rome. And when you leave Rome, you have to pass through this ring, which is like a, a, a ring of Saturn, you know, was defined by Fellini, l'anello di Saturno. It's like something that is around Rome, and no matter what, in order to enter to Rome or to leave Rome, you have to pass by. Three million people live in Rome, and one million people live, one and a half million people will live inside the ring, and one and a half million people will live outside the ring. So this ring is somehow divide the city in two, two parts, you know? It's like a wall around Rome. And uh, it's something that doesn't allow the city to expand or to, in, to breathe in and out. So the film is about a centrif for the centrifuga, centrifugal force. Is that the, the center of Rome expand into this axe that is around. And when I discovered the film, this is the only film I did because um, the idea of making a film there came from someone else. And I never liked the idea of someone telling me, let's make this movie. So I postponed this, I postponed, I said, no, I'm not doing this, I don't know Rome, I don't want to make a film in Rome. Then when I, unfortunately, it was a very sad moment in my life, I had a separation with my wife, and we were living in Rome, and I, and, uh, I said, I'll go back to New York, and she said, no, you don't go back to New York, you stay here, otherwise it's gonna be a big mess. And I accept to be in Rome, and then I called the producer, and said, you still have that project in Rome? <laughs> he said, yes, I have it. And I start discovering this part of the city which I never knew. This is the hell of Roman because in the more everybody has to do this in order to arrive to work, in order to leave. You know, this is a place, the congestion of traffic of things. It's a very a place where everybody gets lost because every exit you never take the right exit. You know, so you always get you know, for two years in this ring. I always took the wrong exit in order to look for a story, and then I find another story. And I was alone. This is a film I did completely on my own in this uh, truck. I was living in a camper because after my separation, I decided to leave to move. It's a very painful moment of my life. I was living in this truck, and I was living in places that I found, like a bed and breakfast, you know, the castle, that was a place where I lived. And for a long, long time, I started going around this place with the film students, with the, someone that was the, guiding me. For one year, again, I didn't shoot anything. It was just collecting story, collecting story, meeting people, meeting people. And then one day, after I had all the encounter of the character, because that's, for me, it's very important to spend time before I start filming. Once I have an idea of the people that I want to tell the story about, then I can start filming. So it was another, it was a year of going around this place and try to find a, a narration, try to find the people. And, uh, and that's what it was, you know, incredible encounter. So there was a place, this place had to be, which is the absolute, I had to meet people that somehow reflect this idea. And after spending two years there, for me, it was a completely abstract place. It didn't have to do anything anymore with Rome. It was something completely abstract. I never went to Rome, which was like half an hour, basically, to arrive to my place where I used to live. So basically, for two years, I lived in this dimension of abstraction, in this ring, which was a, became like a, a complete abstraction, and it didn't have any more roots with the place itself, with Rome. And I started discovering these incredible uh, people and stories that they became part of the, of the film. At the end, you never know where you are, that you could be anywhere. So for me, it was very important, the idea of transform this place in something else, you know, which is, again, in my work, is always a transformation. It's about subtraction, not giving information. And once you meet someone, try to, to, to transform the encounter and the place itself in something else, you know, because we have so much information in this. Uh, we, we go Google, everything is there. So I think now the duty of documentary is not informing anymore, it's not giving information, but somehow is to create story that they go beyond that, you know, that create more an emotional state about the place, that become more universal, that breaks the, the belonging of where they are, and they can be some, something else. And, and the idea of creating always an archetype, you know, like a universality about that. 
And this is what became my obsession when I started filming, you know, to find characters, people that I meet, that I live with them, I stay with them, I spend time with them, and then find a moment of the story that is universal, that goes everywhere, you know. In Japan, this film is like a cult film, <laughs> and I understand why. Uh, and every year, they, my the distributors say that they show the film for two, three weeks. Every year, the film comes out there. And I would like to be Japanese for like two hours and see what they see. But I think they, they see manga, you know, they see like a, a storytelling which is, uh, that doesn't have to do anymore with Rome, but has to do with the people that I met. And the people that I met, there are people that have an incredible strength and an incredible wave, uh, of a force of wave that takes you always somewhere else, you know, and that's uh, the challenge for me, what it is, to find stories that they bring you in a different place, you know. They belong there, but that place has an incredible density that this story can be everywhere in the world, and to, to find the universality on that, to find the archetype, to find the storytelling that uh, that breaks the, the, the original thing, although it belongs to that place, because these people I could not find, if not in Rome. But then what they have and what they give is something which is universal. And this is the challenge always, to find someone like that, you know, in my work. That's a must. And it's something you cannot write, basically. You cannot write at home. But it is a big challenge, for sure. Still, my question is now uh, to you, is about all of the other stories or people you encounter and you throw away out of the film. You decide not to film, because I think certainly around the Gra of Rome, around the ring of Rome. Three million people. Yes, there are quite an endless number yeah. of stories that you can make. And you end up with this constellation of stories. Uh, you spent a year going around the meeting people and not filming. Like in, in Notturno. Exactly, that's where I'm heading. It becomes a bit like the, uh, the... I don't know if it's ever true what they say that Michelangelo said about taking out how do you make the... the, the, the yeah, subtraction, yeah. Yeah, how do you make the, the, the mm. statue? I take out the extra parts, mm -hmm. you know? So in a way, taking out the extra parts is the process, is the method. Can you tell me more about this, especially in Noturno, because it's not even in the Gra, in Sacro Gra, you have a contained... It's endless, but still contained. You have one highway, is your space. But, you know, for me it was impossible to, I remember with Jacopo, we could never find a, a, a right structure for the film. Because I was keep thinking that the, the story was circular. And the story was not circular. At a certain point I met uh, a very important person for me that uh, was called Nicolini. Nicolini was the inventor of the White Knight in Rome in the 60s. He was the head of culture of Rome. Okay. You know the White Knights in the 70s? Whereas, I don't. Okay. But he, so he wrote a lot, so I had to meet him. There is a, a short film uh, uh, which is called Tanti Futuri Possibili, and it's a journey I did around the, the ground with him, with Nicolini, and that's when I understood the film. I understood because he told me, after we finished this journey, he told me, Gianfranco, the only way you can edit this film, and you can structure this film, if, if you open this circle, and you create an infinity line. Only like this you will be able to edit this film. Stop thinking circular. You have to think about a line that is infinitive. And that is, it was so easy to edit because then became a village somehow. It didn't become anymore all the period. It became like the story I had and became uh, the, the the guy with the ambulance, he became the prostitute, he became the palmologist, he became the father and daughter. And once I had this line like this, it became like a small village, and then it was so easy to edit the film, because it lost the circularity, the film. And that was a very important. It's the same thing I did with Notturno to break the, the geographical space, you know? But then before Notturno, it went to the island, to Fuku Amare, Fire at Sea, your film in Malpedusa. The, that, that won the Golden Bear in, in uh, Berlin and was Oscar nominated. And there you did do that on a small island, being Malpedusa, where you went around discovering the people living on the island during the, uh, the wave of refugees right. arriving. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that was, again, a limited space. Very small space. Not 4,000 people lived there, very few people. And uh, again, the film... Uh, 
there, when I went there, I wanted to tell the story of the migrant, but when I arrived there, there was no migrant anymore because political things changed and people that were uh, the center where they were arriving. So for six months, I stayed there without a uh, migrant arriving to the island and I started focusing to the island. They started the things change again and migrants started arriving. And so the film took its own uh, space. So there was the island and there was people arriving to this island. They stayed very few days and they leave. And I just had this brief encounter with this uh, agony with this world that was coming from far away. There were two geographies suddenly that we were meeting. Lampedusa is a small, small place outside Italy. It's out of the map, basically. It doesn't even belong to the map of Italy. It's like very close to the Tunisia. It's the door of Europe. And this island suddenly became the core of my film. The people I met there, again, the, the little boy and the, the the, the people of the island, and then this wave of people passing by, thousands of people every day passing by, but without the possibility of really making a real encounter with them. That's why after this film, Notturno had to come, because I wanted to, to have a contact with this wave of desperation that was coming and try to understand why and where these people were coming. So from, from that place, there was an urgency and a need to to embrace uh, that reality of where these people that I was not, not able to meet because they were arriving, stay one day in the island and leaving. So there are moments, there are fragments of this, this intensity of this wave of people arriving, but uh, there's never an encounter. Everything is at night because night can deceive the things. You know, at night you can tell a story that the game Notturno, the night, you know, that's where I started that film in the, at night, uh, Notturno, and then slowly, slowly, it goes to the light, but um, so it's all it's all very linked. All that you know, the, I I I can clearly see and mm. and ask you, in this kind of method of of work, uh, can you avoid regrets? Do you not uh, have missing characters? You spoke about missing things. Do you think in each one of these journeys, each one of these films? there were persons or stories that you didn't have at the end that you miss? Constantly. I realized that uh, making film for me is about missing things. It's not about gaining things. And then there's one moment that you grab, and that moment is worth everything. I remember when I did, um, when I did uh, Fire at Sea, Foca Mare, uh, Bertolucci, two years before, he gave me the Golden Lion in Venice for Sacco Gra. And he wanted to see the film. I said, I want to see if you are really, if, if you deserve the Golden Lion. So before I went to Berlin, he asked me to see the film. He told me something very important there. He said, you know what is the strength of this film? It's like uh, you're able to see things you didn't film or you didn't show us. This film, it, it contains so much that you left outside. Either you didn't film or you didn't put in the editing. And that for me was a moment that, which was always there. And it's true, it's like a, making a picture. You know, once you do a, a picture, this picture has a before, has an after. But this picture has to be a synthesis of something. A good frame, you have to be able to show what is in your back, not only what you see. So it has to contain everything. And, you know, you, you have 80 hours of footage and the film is only two hours. And the rest, the rest is loud, but it's not. The rest is there, it's part of the film. You saw my raw footage in the film. I think what we left out in the editing of Notturno is still there, it's part of the film. What I didn't film is part of, of the, the people I met and they're not in the movie because uh, there was no space for that. They're part of the film. So making film for me is about missing, it's not about gaining, it's not about collecting. And that's why for me it's important to have one frame and waiting for the frame to narrate in that story, just that single frame, and not moving around constantly, moving, 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 you know? I would love to make a film with a huge camera that you cannot move it, you know, like big, big camera that creates this uh, sense of boom, it's there, the camera is there. And once you have the chance of moving constantly the camera, you're not able to focus on nothing. Uh, for me, it's about finding that frame, and that frame, you have to wait till things happen in front of it, and suddenly there's a story there. And when you wait, 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 when you have that frame, 
whatever you miss is there, is part of that frame for me. That's what is very this important. This is beautiful. Mm. And I can't... Otherwise, we are like dog marking a territory, you know? We don't want that. And we don't want that. Yeah, I think it is... Uh, <laughs> then this kind of approach comes with what is very special in your approach, in your style, in your language, which is the fact that you do your camera and sound yourself. You always have somebody helping you or assisting you, but... Well, my first three films I was completely alone. Yeah. Both my Bilosi level and uh, Sicario, and I never had any assistant. With Sacro Gra, I started having an assistant halfway. And then with the Farazzi, I had always an assistant with me, which was uh, Peppino, which uh, he, he was a part of the island. He was the one that helped me to get inside the houses there. And then, of course, uh, uh, Notturno, I had a fantastic assistant, which they became my voice, you know, my partner, they were translating to me, they were part of that, but always never more than one person with me, because uh, for me it's very important to create this intimacy, this relationship, this um, uh, waiting, because uh, you can, I cannot afford to have a crew waiting for that moment. Sometimes I spend two weeks waiting for the right light. That's a very important composition for me, the light, you know, to wait for the, for the clouds to wait for the right light, to wait for... I cannot shoot with any light condition, you know. I had to wait the light. Uh, um, that's why Notturno, at the beginning, was a film I wanted to film at night. Uh, you remember Notturno was because I wanted to film all at night because I felt protected by the night. A stick can be a snake, and a snake can be a, sneak at uh, a stick at night. So there is that moment of, uh, of uh, not be able to grab exactly what you're filming. And then slowly, slowly became like uh, sunrise and sunset, endless sunrise and sunset, and then became uh, clouds. You know, I had to be protected by the clouds. The clouds uh, become like a, an element of narration for me. From a, from even boatman, I was waiting for the clouds there because uh, I felt protected with the clouds. That you can move 360 degree, and and not having to worry about the sun hitting your lens. And then you're able to find the right frame there. You're able to find the right distance. And you don't have to worry about shade. You don't have to worry about this, uh, uh, shade and darkness and things. Um, uh, when you film with clouds, everything is uh, so um, smooth and so homogeneous that you can move 360 degree and always find the right, the perfect frame and the perfect uh, narration with the clouds. So sometimes I can wait two weeks for the right light and I cannot afford to have uh, a crew. I have to have a very patient uh, companion, which is an assistant that I have, and you know how fantastic they were, all the people I work with, that uh, they trust me and I trust them, and uh, together we're able to wait for the right moment. And yeah, it's I, an incredible intimacy that you create, you know, with the person you work with. That's why at the beginning I was working alone, because uh, I could never force anyone to wait two months to. Uh, to start to shooting one frame, you know, I couldn't afford. But when you're alone, um, you can afford all mistakes and you can wait, and you can be... And I I, frankly, I don't like filming, you know. I don't like the moment I have the camera. I have an enormous anxiety. It's like when I, I do this talk, I have an enormous... We were talking before, you know. Do I, I feel like I have to shoot. Uh, uh, and then once you start filming, the fear goes away and you start discovering something which is so magic and so fantastic and unique. But camera changed things constantly. When you put the camera, it changed the dynamic, it changed the relationship. Uh, I don't believe in a observation of cinema, in truth of cinema. Once the camera is there, you change the dynamic and you change the relationship. Everything that happened after is something else, no matter what. Uh, so it doesn't exist the objectivity, it doesn't exist uh, the reality of the things. You know, exists there the truthfulness of what you're filming and why you're filming, what you film, that's what it is. And that's, that's why for me it's not important the difference between fiction and documentary. It's important the difference between true and false. That's what is important. And um, the awareness of that what you're filming is real, is there, and belong to that moment. When I film uh, Ali, I can film him in so many different ways, but I have to be, my duty as a documentarist is to find his essence and his reality, and that's what I have to be able to portrait. How I do it doesn't matter, but it's important what I film and what is there in the film is exactly him. 
or even a landscape, or even a, a, a place that is being destroyed by war. You have to find that frame that is not just building that broke down. That frame has to tell a story, even in the emptiness. A tree, a landscape, a soldier waiting has to tell a story that is beyond that. And, and in order to do that, um, you have to be able to, to spend time and to find so many elements that guide you. Cinema, distance, language, sound. There are all these elements that uh, creates that moment of truthfulness. And how you arrive there doesn't matter. That's why it's not about beauty. It's about uh, what Rossellini used to say, the splendor of reality. And, uh, and, um, and they betrayed of history most of the time. Gianfranco, I can do this for another three hours without any hesitation. Six days we can go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, however, uh, time is... We have six films, we can do one, one day yes, for every film. Absolutely. Six days. I, th I think time is uh, not on our side in this one. The, uh, this is like, like the dentist. I was, I was just starting to be comfortable and now it's gone. <laughs> So I believe that we will continue in many different ways, but I want to tell you that, yes, indeed, whenever we talk about your work, we talk about all of it at the same time. And this is what I find fascinating about this body of work of yours, that when we speak about Botman or Sacrogra or Foucault Amare or Below Sea Level or Il Sicario or Notturno, we understand more about all of them because we, we get to, to discover your own journey as our, our guide in this. That's why when you were forcing me to find 10 titles, which I never, I would never be able to find 10 titles of the top film, but we were able and it's fantastic. We did, we have a fantastic top 10 selection from you now. And, and I suggest to read how we arrived to that 10 uh, film because I think it was very fun and I don't even remember the film we selected. <laughs> No, but I think we published a good, a good <laughs> article on this. But the way we arrived to, to, to have that list was extremely good. But I remember at a certain point I took a book and I say, this, uh, this book is more important than all the film. And it was the, film, the book of uh, Rossellini. It's called El Mio Metodo, My Method. And I think the duty of every filmmaker is uh, to find a method, you know, to find a method and to be able always to experiment on that method, you know, from the beginning to push it, push it, push it. And that's the beauty of documentary, I keep saying that, you know. Documentary allowed, with, with not, without experimenting, there's no documentary. And the language of documentary has been such an incredible journey, you know, from flirty to now. And it's something that is always an evolution, evolution, evolution. Uh, this year at the Oscar, they are like running documentary from all over the world. And uh, my friend in America, they said documentary are the most interesting film right now. We compare fiction and documentary. We have like 10, 15, 20 films that are fantastic this year for the Oscar um, uh, nominee. And, um, you know, feature film, maybe three, four are good. Documentary, 20, 30 are extremely good from all over the world. It is a phenomenon. It's, it's never phenomenon. happened before. It, it never happened before, but yet <laughs> it's something that is keep moving, moving, moving. And because... Uh, we have to experiment constantly. We have to find always a language, a challenge, and not repeating ourselves. Every time, for me, every film I start is the first film, and the last, I always say, because it's so consuming. This is my first and last film, I always say, from Boatman up to now, I always say, I don't want to make a movie anymore because it's so consuming, and I don't want my life to be dictated by six movies. I want something else to happen in my life, but unfortunately, the only films that's happening are happening in my life. But... <laughs> And, uh, and that's what is fantastic about documentaries, about you are able to experiment, to challenge yourself, and to find always a language. That's why I have such an enormous hate uh, of um, commission editor that they, are, they force you to write a script. And you give the script to them, and they give you money for a script you give, and then the, the film has to be that script. And that's wrong. You start with a lie. My teacher used to say, he was a smoker, he used to have these matches. And he said, the story cannot be bigger than this matchbox. 
Otherwise, you start with a lie. And when we give to, to Netflix, things, blah, 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 a script, and then people film exactly what is in the script, this is the death of documentary. You have to start with something very small, having the time to develop and let these things to become something else. Because you don't know what's... Uh, when, I start, uh, when I start my journey in the Middle East, you know, I didn't know anything about it. And now, after three years, we have a film that w would have been impossible to write down or to uh, I don't it. think it can be written down even after it was made. Yeah. Uh, and I think it... And that's why I think it's such a limitation the, about documentary when they ask you a script, a script, a script. You cannot write a script. You can write an idea. And that idea has to be extremely pregnant, extremely thick. And that idea has to be written in 10, ten lines. But and that's that where the film has to But be. that requires trusting the filmmaker. Mm. Trust I think that's the, that's the But that's challenge. why I spent years, years, years producing the film on my own, because I was never able... I think when I, also here there were pitches, and I felt like I cannot lie, go there to say what? It's not true what I'm saying. So that's why I refused always in my life to do. And that's why every film, it took me years, years, years to do it, because I never had the money to do it. And now, finally, the biggest freedom I have, and I have to thank so many people that really support me and trust me, that with few pages, they say, OK, we trust you, go with it. We don't know what you can come with, but you know you're going to have a film at the end. And this is what um, we have to, to, to do, you know, like commission editing, when, when you have a script which is so thick, is the, is the end of documentary. What would you, to, this will be my last question, and it is just to ask you, how would you now um, talk to filmmakers in the beginning then, when they are facing this request, if you want financing, you need to lie or to script things you don't know yet. How do you suggest, what do you recommend they do? I say, don't, I say you, your first, second film you have to do on your own completely. Work like I did, make, I did cameraman things, uh, dubbing, I did so many work in order to be able to make my own movies. And I never asked for, for money at the beginning, because asking for money, I, th I thought, was like, I didn't deserve that money, because I didn't know which film I was going to do it. And the freedom to do your own f film, and to find in that film exactly your identity, and who you are, and what you want to say, is fantastic. And that's what the filmmaker had to have to do. And now we can do it. You know, before it was in 16 million, it was so expensive. And now with a with small camera, you can do film on your own. You don't need to raise money. Then if you're lucky, you can get some funding, something. But I think we have to refuse to, to write script for documentary. You have to write a very strong idea, and it's there. The idea has to be there. Otherwise, there's no way you can encounter what is in your mind. Because you're, you have to wait for something that is in your mind. That very core that is there has to be there. Otherwise, you, when I see my film, I say, well, I didn't do anything. It was all there. You know, I didn't invent anything because it was all there. But to, to capture that moment, if you don't have that, that core inside, that literal space that is the synthesis of all your work, and that's, if you don't have that, you're not able to recognize where to put the camera. OK, this is yes, no, 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 yes, yes, this is yes, this is no, this is yes, this is no. It has to be very fast. But you can do that not when you have a script, but when you have that core, when you have that essential idea which is the same when you work with the, car, with the person that you just met, you don't know anything about, Ali, I didn't know anything, the hunter, the thing. I just met him in the back, I saw him, I stopped him, I saw his face, it was like you fall in love with these people. You say, okay, this is a story I want to tell. But suddenly, and you're there in their life, and you have to build a trust, and then what you film, every day, he has sound things, go, no, you have to say, no, 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 what I film, I film this little fragment of his life, very small. But this fragment has to be universal, has to be huge, has to be so intimate, which is the synthesis of life. That's what it is when you film, you know? I can, uh, because every person I film could be a 10 hours movie, but then in the film becomes 10 minutes, one minute, three minutes, five minutes. And how you film that five minutes if you don't have that idea, which is there, which is a sacred idea, which you can hold it inside, and you cannot write it in a script. That has to be there. So with this 
image of Prometheus carrying this idea. I am very thankful that we had this good talk and honored to have you with us, Gianfranco. I, I don't believe uh, who is talking is my producer. <laughs> I, am, I am. So it was very difficult today to, but the good thing is that when uh, we start I'm just working. Learning. I'm still learning. But when we start working together, we didn't know each other. We were introduced by uh, Serge. We didn't know anything about each other. We met in this incredible journey. Thanks to you, I was able to, to film and to meet incredible people in, uh, in such a difficult world that I didn't know anything. Uh, you were a guide for me, distant, always at the phone. We met maybe three times in our life. And uh, we, met, be here. we met very deeply. Deeply, and, yeah. And I think it you is... Came, you, you came to... When I did the first, first, first uh, uh, editing of the film, it was incredible. You know, you gave me the right immediately uh, because I say he knows everything about that world. And, and for me, it was such an important thing that you say, yes, you're on the right track because you know that world so much. And so your world for me was uh, incredible. It gave me this, the strength to, be, to keep editing, to keep, go back, to keep filming, to keep um, uh, making this film. As a foreigner, it was so difficult to approach that world. And for me, having you as a guide was so important. I think you are a chronicle foreigner, Gianfranco. I don't think you are. <laughs> you are always protecting the fact that you are a foreigner, even in Roma. Even All over, yeah, in, wherever you go, and I want to say that yes, it is also a great, uh, deeply deep learning process to me. That I, uh, when I decided to end my career as producer, your film was one of the last things I was in, involved with, and it makes me feel um, confident that what we do in festivals, for documentary film, or as filmmakers, as producers, as different kinds of people serving, connecting this idea of documentary <coughs> film with the audience is simply a valid suggestion for a better world. And a better world does not mean political change tomorrow morning. It means us, all of us, feeling better feeling that we can do better. So, thank you very much. Thank you. And I hope everybody uh, keeps an eye on the other films of Shiran Franco in, in ITFA this year, and also in the top 10, to see what are the films from the history of cinema that we ended up discovering stayed in his mind, deeply implanted, although he denied that in the beginning but we got the information out of him in a very peaceful manner at the end. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much. And I want, to, I want to thank the people that I had the patience to see the film um, in their own house or wherever they are. And uh, thank you to the people that are watching, not from this uh, theater, but from home. And uh, thank you for the patience of, uh, of enduring this. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>